Now, without, I don't want to waste any time, Betunan. We're going straight over to Mama Lorette, who will make us fly and travel Australia and Oceania. Please give Mama Lorette a round of applause, who will do the prophetic intercession, revival, and harvest outcry. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah. Deep down in my heart, the spirit is moving. Deep down in my heart, as the prophet said it would be. Hallelujah. Deep down in my heart, there's a mighty rest. Revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can you just pray for yourself that deep down in your heart, the spirit would move and that you would have revelation of the glory of the Lord covering the nations of the earth in these last days. God says that the glory of the Lord will cover the nations. There will be a revelation of the glory of God. Let it start in your own heart. Holy Spirit, we so are so grateful to you for the way you are leading us in this prayer summit. We thank you for sharing the burden that's on the heart of our Lord Jesus with us. Now we want to ask you as we continue on in prayer that you would move deep down in our heart. We don't want to just pray. We want to touch the heart of our master. We want to touch the heart of our father who is in heaven. We want those desperate cries to reach you and that you would know that out of this city of East London, where you said the end time rival would break forth, that there are those that have been moved by their heart to pray, to cry, to take your burden in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, I don't know what to say. I don't know whether I should just cry and we all cry. You know, I don't know. I thank you so much, all my fellow missionaries in this congregation. John is a missionary. Light is a missionary. Mama Heart is a missionary. Henry and his wife, Mampo, they are missionaries. There may be others amongst, but I want to say that even the pastor of this church is a missionary. We met on the mission field. She was South African. She was even in the city where she had been for some time, but she was called as a missionary. I was still there when Maureen and Rocco left the comfort of the suburbs and came to live in Cocabana. And we lived in different circumstances. I'm still a missionary today. You know, people like to give you titles, pastors, prophets, but in my heart, whenever anyone asks me, what's my profession? I feel in any form, I'm a missionary. What's a missionary? It's one who was sent. And you know, I was the most unlikely candidate to be sent um, in the natural. But this I know that God just looks for willingness and obedience. I heard the cry of God's heart. And I loved the word of God. And the word of God said, go. So I said, I'm going wherever. It turned out to be South Africa. Turned out to be the city of East London. Turned out to be the Kosa Nation. The 17th of May, I finished 17 years on the mission field. And I'm not finished yet. No, don't need to clap your hands. My obedience, God has blessed. I am so, so blessed. Just because God says, if you obey, you will be blessed. I don't need to pray for blessing. I don't need a year of blessing. God says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And the key to unlock the blessings is simple obedience. Obedience to what the word of God says. And, you know, people are, are always wanting to unlock finances. So they're wanting to obey the financial scriptures so that they get that blessing. I tell you this. Follow the one that Jesus said, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all other things 
will be added to you. I want us to look at Australia and Oceania, a bit like uh, my brother John. I don't know why I was given Australia and Oceania, but I want to share one or two scriptures and then I want us to pray. My heart is broken today. You know, when you see Jesus from last night, you know, I woke up to pray at, at the midnight hour last night and I was just thinking, those people that are dropping into hell as I'm standing here in the place of prayer, people are dropping into hell, even in this very city where we are. And who cares? I looked out my window several times. I thought, Lord, have I done well in warning my neighbors? Have I done well in preaching the gospel? I've been living in Duncan Village since 2016. And I came there and I was so sure revival was going to break out. I was so sure people were going to be saved because I went there in obedience to God. And I look today and I still see closed hearts drunkards. I do see little things that God is doing, but I don't know if I've worked with the Lord the way I ought to have. I don't know if I've labored in prayer. I don't know if, if I've been obedient enough. I remember when I came to South Africa in 1984, I couldn't go anywhere. Every single human being I came in contact with, I wanted to know, if you die tonight, where will you arrive? when you wake up. It was a very simple truth that had come to my own life when I realized, sitting in a church, that if I was to die there and then, Christian all my life, growing up in the church, I was not going to enter heaven. And when I discovered that there is a way, his name is Jesus, I wanted to make sure that people pass by this religion called Christianity and they find Jesus Christ. And so that burden was always with me. I used to embarrass my friends. You know, I, I was a dancing teacher the first time I came to South Africa. Um, that was what brought me my second time. I came as a missionary. And so I had um, some dancing teacher friends and they... One in particular, who is now in Cape Town, who was at that time in Howick in KZN. We went, you know, I went to visit her and we were in this, I don't know, it was some kind of fair, agricultural fair. And she kept meeting people. And every time I'd meet someone, I'd speak to them and I'd say, do you know Jesus Christ? If you're to die today, that was my, that was my simple point of contact, looking at the person. I don't know where I lost it. I don't know where I lost, but I want that passion back that every soul I meet, wherever I go, I have that same burden. I don't want anyone to go to hell. Do you know why? I hate wickedness and I hate things that the wicked are doing. But Jesus said that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. You know, he granted me repentance. I didn't do anything to deserve it. But you know what took me there? I found out later the prayer of my sister who had got saved. And she took me as a prayer item to the congregation where she worshipped. I was a prayer point. This sister of hers that thinks she's a Christian, but she's on her way to hell. I was a dancing teacher. There was a young pupil, and it's interesting, she was of what you would call here colored. Her mother was Scottish. Her father was Indian, the dark Indian, so she was quite dark, and she struggled a bit with that whole uh, thing of being different in Scotland. And, but she was born again, and she got a, a burden for her dancing teacher. That was me. And out of their prayers... God stirred my heart to seek him. Out of our prayers in this summit, God will stir the hearts of people to seek them. Never underestimate your prayers. All we are saying here is expand your prayer life. We are good at praying for our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our children, our husbands, because their lives touch us very personally. But God is way more concerned about them. 
He didn't save you just for your own sake and the sake of your family. I realized that quite soon, that he saved me, that I might become a savior to others, that I might give my life back to the one who died for me, that through this life, other people might come to Christ. And so we are here in this Global Prayer Summit expanding our vision. You know, South Africans, you are so self-centered, so full of self-pity. You know, you don't know what you've got. You've got so, so much in this country. First time I went into another country in Africa, I realized South Africa is a different African country. There's so much God has given South Africa. But you know, the majority of South Africans, and still today, you despise the people that God used to build this nation to greatness. I'm not afraid to say it. You don't need to look at the whiteness of my skin. I'm not saying that because I'm white. Because when I came here, I realized I had so much repentance to do on behalf of colonialism. But at the same time, you cannot throw away the baby with the bathwater. You know what God did in bringing nations into South Africa was amazing. May we grow up. May we grow up. May we circumcise our hearts. You know, I came here, I was the wrong color, I was the wrong gender, I was too young to do what God called me to do. But just out of giving my life to him, he enabled me to do things that others wouldn't do. There was a, a saying we had in Speed the Light, our mission going, where few are willing to go. A white woman going into the townships, going into the villages, and people misunderstanding me because I'm looking like the enemy, because I'm white. I was despised by white people because I spent my time with black people. I was despised by black people because I was white. But you know what? My heart, my heart still was beating with the heartbeat of God. I hated religion because it nearly took me to hell. And I saw South Africa, a religious country with a religion called Christianity and the majority of the people going to hell. Now, why can I say that? Because there were so many Pentecostal churches, so many evangelical churches. I hadn't seen as many in Scotland because the one thing that indicates that you are a believer was missing love. That love that doesn't look at the color of your skin, doesn't look at the listen to the language you're speaking, it's the love that's in the heart of God. When he sent Jesus Christ to this world, he didn't send him to die for the Jewish people, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He sent him to die for the world. Can I ask you to put up my place of prayer, Australia and Oceania. You know, I look at South Africa and I see South Africans running away from South Africa. I see in Nigeria, Nigerians running away from Nigeria. And I said to Mama Hart's daughter, Victory, I don't mind you going to Canada, but you must know what you're going into. The woke agenda in Canada the backslidden nation of Canada, the atheistic culture of Canada, the demonic culture of Canada. I said to Victoria, unless you're going there with a missionary heart, you're going for the wrong reason. If you're running away from the economic situation in Nigeria, you're leaving for the wrong reason. You're going as an African to the ends of the earth to try to bring light into darkness. I want to read from Acts chapter 17. Thank you so much, Pastor Light, for your obedience. Thank you so much. I remember when I started going on to your, just your prayer ones, when you started this prayer network online, and I, I again began to look at the nations of the world. 
And I thank you for persevering. I know you've had your own trials, your own tribulations, just as I have, and any missionary will always have. But there's a joy set before us, just like Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. He knew he was going to bring nations to the Father. He was going to reconcile the lost to the Father who created them, who still loved them despite their rebellion, their stubbornness. And so he was willing to go with us. Keep on carrying your cross, Pastor Light, Mama Heart. Keep on carrying your cross, Pastor John. We'll keep on till the very end. There's no turning back. There's no turning back. It's the cross before us, the world behind us. And to this backsliding nation of South Africa, get right with God. Take up your cross and follow him. Why is it that we backslide in South Africa the way we do? Why is it that we think backsliding is a common factor? A common denominator in Christianity, it is not meant to be so. You can get saved and never backslide. You might sin, but you'll never backslide. I have made mistakes as a missionary, but I have never turned back. And I never will turn back. Acts chapter 17. I want to read from verse... 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, for he is worshipped, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring therefore since we are the offspring of god we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone something shaped by art and man's devising truly say after me truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now, say now, but now command all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has assurance, given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When I was weeping on the floor during that time of worship, that time of judgment, that time of Jesus judging, it's getting ever closer. It's getting ever closer. The avenue, the time frame to repent is going to come to an end. How passionate are you about calling people to repentance? How passionate are you about repenting yourself? Do you Are you the one that needs repentance? I really believe that so much of the church needs repentance. You know, we were praying on the time of the new moon. I wasn't supposed to lead the prayers. It was Apostle Mangaliso, but for some reason, he got mixed up and he didn't come on. And so I took up the prayers and we began to pray for the church, God's instrument to reach these nations, to reach every one of these continents of the earth. And I knew the church is not in a good state. And I knew that we have been failing the Lord, like John said. And I was saying, let's pray for the refining fire. 
as it says in Malachi chapter 3, and then as we begin to pray, and as we begin to cry out to God for us, God's instruments to reach the lost in these last days, not only to pray, but to reach them, I began to see the church. And I knew there's a battle. And the Lord said, the battle is not for the soul of Africa. The battle is for the soul of the church. And then I saw the church and I saw what I thought should be an army going out. And I saw there was no helmet of salvation. <laughs> There was no helmet of salvation. There was a huge church, but no helmet of salvation. And I realized we can say South Africa, we are 80% Christian. We are liars. We are not saved. We are not born again. We have not got the mind of Christ. We've not got the heart of the Father. We are self-centered. We want we want things for ourselves. We want to take, take back, not from the devil what he has stolen. We want to take back from people what we think they have stolen. Read what we have just read again. Who pre-appoints the times and the places for the people. Put up the picture of Oceania again. You know Oceania and, uh, and Australia. Today, there are so many nations, so many people groups there. I looked even at Australia. I knew Australia from my, my childhood. Australia was a place that was colonized by my own country, Britain. It was colonized. But when they went there, there were people there. There were the Aborigines. But where did they come from? You know, I've realized in this Global Prayer Summit yet again, I've realized that time, that time when they were building the Tower of Babel, they were all there. Remember, we hadn't yet multiplied and filled the earth as God had given the command to Adam. We hadn't yet reached that place where we had filled this earth. But after then, he scattered the peoples and the peoples began to move over the earth. There's no nation can say, this is my nation. This land belongs to me. The land belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And he is the one that will call every human being. He has planted on any part of his earth at any time to give account for how they have stewarded the earth and how they have stewarded the people of that earth. And so we've gotten... Australia and Oceania, people from all sorts of nations of the world. I want us to go before the Lord. I don't know how much time have I got, by the way, because I've not prayed yet, but I need to know my time. Until 20 past, okay. It's fine. We are going to pray. Now, you know, here we are in Australia. I don't know if I can still find it on my phone. I was looking at all the peoples that are in Australia. And you know, apart from the the um, origin, you know, the original ones that were there when they they went when the Europeans went to to colonize, it, it was the Aboriginal people, and they actually said that they had come down from Africa. We, we used to call Australia down under. They still say down under because it's down at the bottom. But in that nation, you would be surprised. There are people from the United Kingdom, there are people from the United States, there are people from Vietnam, there are people from Canada, there are people from Korea, there are people from Hong Kong, there are people from Germany, there are people from China, there's people from Japan, there's people from Turkey. There's people of every people group of the earth in this place called Australia and Oceania. But this is what I want us to pray. I don't know if any of you have uh, followed Jonathan Can. He's a Messianic Jew speaking very much on the end times, giving us prophetic understanding. He wrote a book, Return of the Gods. 
You see, they left Great Britain and they went to the nations. We can say they went to colonize, but you know the hand of God. It says in the Bible, he pre-appointed times and he pre-appointed boundaries. Not everybody left with a wicked intention. And God himself knew his intention. He wanted this book called the Bible that had actually managed to be through the United Kingdom, had been printed and was sent to nations. That's why even English got God granted language to so many nations, not because the British were so great, because he wanted it to get the word of God to the people. So they went to the gospel there. And there was a strong church, a living church. In Europe, it was so. I grew up with the, the moral values, the, the values that I grew up with were all from the Bible in the economy, in treating the poor well, in treating the foreigner well. That's why today Europe and the United Kingdom is in such a big mess, because they still had a heart for the nations. And so now you find that there's indigenous British are very few, and foreigners are filling and taking over the land. It's the same with Australia. Now what happened as nations began to backslide? Remember in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, what Jesus said. And this is a revelation that Jonathan Cann got. Before the gospel went to all of these nations, including uh, every nation of the world outside of Israel, where God had made himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and made for himself his firstborn nation, Israel. Every other nation was worshipping other gods in every continent of the world. And so when the gospel went out from there, it went to every other nation had gods. So the gospel went as the gospel and the power of the gospel went. Every knee had to bow. And the principalities and the powers that had ruled nations, including my nation, Scotland, including England, Ireland, we were all pagans, all the nations of the world. But when the gospel came, those gods were displaced. And as people came to Christ and as nations took the gospel as the foundation for their nation, they built the kingdom yeah, of God and the structure of nations yeah, in Europe for many years was built on the structure of the kingdom of God and the values. And it went also to Australia. But as Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I come. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first but he doesn't finish talking about men. What does he say? Last line. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Nations who once. Mama Lorette, your mic is off. Mama Lorette, please unmute.
only thing I love about the prodigal son is that the father didn't give up. Father didn't give up. You know, when I hear what is happening in Australia now, when I see and I think of the South Africans who think they're running from South Africa for a better life in Australia, oh, they're going to get a rude awakening. <laughs> when they see what's happening there, when they see the authoritarianism that's come back, it was a penal colony. It was prisoners that the UK sent there. There's a hardness in the foundations of the white people in Australia, and it's beginning to manifest again as those gods are coming back. Can you go down on your knees and can you cry out to God for mercy? Can you cry out to God for his mercy on Australia in Oceania and the nations of the world that have become prodigal before God? Oh God, our oh Lord, you gave to us the most precious gift you could give you gave us your son jesus christ and you gave us the word of god and you sent us out to the ends of the earth you sent your missionaries to the ends of the earth you sent them to australia you sent them to oceana and lord god the gospel was received and the kingdom of god came and the church of the lord jesus christ was built and the nation became great it began to prosper it began to flourish and all the nations all the islands round about and all the peoples heard of a god who loved them heard of a god who cared for them heard of a god who sent his son to die for them and so the gospel spread and spread and then you were in darkness came to the light but oh my God, oh my God, we came from out. We became our good. And we thought we didn't need you anymore. We thought we didn't need you. Our pride, our arrogance became rebellion against you. We became stubborn and the gods have come back. The gods have come back and the nation doesn't know you. Oh God, Oh God. <laughs> oh God. Oh God. The enemy is coming like a flood. Raise up a standard out of your church. Bring forth a remnant. Bring forth a remnant. Who have not bowed their knee to the gods of this world? Who have not bowed their knee to mammon? Who have not bowed their knee to the new age? Who have not bowed their knee but still hold to the truth of the gospel that saves, the gospel that forgives sins, the gospel that transforms lives. Raise up your church again in Australia. Raise up your church in the islands of Oceania. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want us to have another prayer. You know, Jesus said, and he's still saying it today. Don't say four months more and then the harvest. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Look at Australia. It's ripe for harvest. I have no problem with you going to Australia if you're going as a missionary with the fire of Africa, the fire of the spirit burning in you. If you're not just going there to escape the problems of Africa, you can go with my blessing. But go on the mission of God, not on a runaway from troubles and trials, because this is the continent God is going to use here in the last days. But I want us to pray. He said, the harvest is plentiful, and the workers, the workers, the workers, the laborers are few, as the Lord of the harvest, thrust out laborers into the harvest field. Can we make that our prayer? Can we ask God out of Africa, out of South Africa, thrust laborers into
backfield of this backslidden continent of Australia and Oceania. Father, that is my cry. That is my cry, my God and my Lord, that even as you captured my own as you captured my own heart as a young believer, as a young believer in the nation of Scotland. Lord, I heard your word. I heard the cry. I heard your word. And I heard the cry. And I say, yes, Lord, I will go. Lord, let them hear the cry. Let them hear the cry. Lord, we know the time is short. Send it does again, Lord. Send your church again to the end of the earth. Let the glitter of gold, let the glitter of diamonds, let the pleasures of this world pass away in their eyes and let them see the true treasures, the treasures of darkness, the souls of men, the souls of women, the souls of young people and children growing up without the knowledge of God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Who will go and help them make a decision? Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us our self-centeredness. Forgive us our selfishness. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, it was when Isaiah was in that place of worship. He was in that place of prayer. He was in the place of worship. He was in the place of prayer. And he heard God saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? Can we pray that in this season, as congregations gather in the nations of the world, as they gather, they won't just think worship is just about singing nice songs, but they will hear the cry of the heart of God. Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? Father, that is our desire. Father, even today, during our time of worship, I could hear your call. Let others also hear, Father. Let us hear, Father. Let us be willing. Let us be willing and obedient in our generation. Lord, you will not be left without workers for your harvest field that we'll not meet you, and you will say to us, I told you to go, but you decided to stay. I told you to be my witnesses, but you kept quiet. Lord, let the fire and the passion of Christ burn in our hearts. Let the love of Christ compel us until we can say like Paul, for me to live as Christ, to die, to die to self is gain. In Jesus' name, amen. Let your fire fall, let the river flow, 
Let it burn inside and flow outside.